But um, uh, I guys, uh, I guess today, I think we had actually I I had one topic, which was I know to be honest, I we really put it fully, fully fully put it to words, but I think the best way I can be really, like ask or explain the question is kind of like you know when you write like as a writer we kind of either intentionally or unintentionally write to either to an audience or to ourselves and i feel like because i'm going through like the kind of monte cristo and what i find interesting about that is there'll be some moments in there where he's like where the writer is kind of like the narrator is kind of telling you oh yeah as you know things are kind of like this it, with this certain play and you know as you know in this place here things are like this and it just really gives me that feeling of oh he's kind of he's kind of writing to a, an audience who lives in that place like obviously the time that's passed over like it's, it's like the book was made years ago as well but like it feel like he's writing to that to certain people in that certain place and it's really made me think like is there like I, don't, I, I can't really see much writers doing like doing that nowadays because I think just simply because the world in a way has gotten like smaller with just how technology is. Mm -hmm. I think we're more aware or cognizant, whether like unconsciously or consciously of like how far, like if we were to write something, it's probably going to be to a, like a wider audience than just like your local area. That's my thoughts on it. But I don't know, like, I, I don't know what you think. Cause I just, I'm still trying to like. Um, I was, I was thinking about it, like as I was working, uh, I was sort of thinking about it, and what you said um, when a lot of writers, I think that's, I think that's true. A lot of writers won't do that, but I think that if you were, I think people who write more in the realm of realistic fiction, mm -hmm. even in this day and age, are probably still going to do that. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I mean, a lot of people who write especially realistic fiction, I feel like don't, I feel like a lot of them aren't writing um, with the intent to, you know, with the intent for it to spread to an audience outside of, mm. of the area that they're familiar with. Like if you, yeah. if you did like, cause I'm, I'm just thinking about certain, you know, I've been reading a little bit of slice of life manga lately and a lot of them, you know, a lot of them sort of imply that a lot of the activities that they, that they're doing are the status quo mm -hmm. of activities or like the expected. And when I see that and I'm like, wow, it's crazy that, you know, these kids go on these extravagant field trips, but in my head, they're extravagant because you don't get field trips like that in America as a high schooler, but they're, there's sort of, you know, it's the status quo. So I think it's still done, but I think mm. you'll see it more at Count of Monte Cristo. And that's kind of in that same realm of the, the realistic fiction where they're, yeah. they're writing to, as you said, a specific group, but it's not intended to reach a, a, a wider audience than that. That's just how I was thinking on it. But I didn't get to spend too much time. So if, there's, if it doesn't sound... If it's not sound, then tell me exactly where it wasn't and why. Oh, how can I? Yeah, that, that sounds that, that sounds sound to me. It's just I think with because I'm still trying to like I'm still trying to process it myself. But yeah, I think that's one one of the main things as well is me personally. Most of the stories I go through are like fantasy or you know sci like or sci-fi. So there's just that inherent fact of you're not really gonna find oh as you as you know this happens here because most things in that sort of genre is kind of like it's a lot of the narration is actually trying to get the right the reader accustomed to that world anyways so um there's that fact as well and yeah i can definitely see like i think as well um i can see like more like writing writing that's more like set in taking the you know, template like a more like size life or more like you know taking the more real realistic take on like you know its background and history can they could there yeah, they could easily you know lean off you know you know going around that going that angle um but yeah and also there's nothing in fact in, in a way because i just trying to think about because i always always like to think 
there is there is um always a trade-off for anything you do in right now it's no it's, or, or anything in life there's no like true oh if you do this and do it 100 percent it's going to be great if you usually take things too far it becomes an extreme and that becomes a negative and obviously you can go you can go too far trying to like obviously you know you can go too far when you're trying to write for if you try write like this whole saying if you try write for everyone you're going to be writing for no one you can go too far that way but you can i could say you can go too far the opposite way but i'm thinking top head compared like between them two i think it's better to um specify than it is to generalize if there is if there was like a oh, i don't know how to put it but like yeah like there's there's extremely either side but i think it's more it's more I think it's more in your benefit to to kind of specify if you're able to in your story so like in that sense where you know they're kind of saying oh as you must know this and kind of it, it just it kind of helps just add more character you know what i mean so overall things of benefit but it just i just got me just it just genuinely got me thinking about like okay how much like do does much right and do that anymore because there are there are things in in older books that we don't really see much more no more like monologuing is not actually done too much so i just thought maybe is that like just another product of something that isn't in it just in like more in older books or is it like yeah or is it just the genre i'm reading so yeah that's, that's my uh thing in it yeah. yeah um oh okay i thought you had something to say oh um well <laughs> Not much I can really think of outright, but mm. on the subject of internal monologue, like, um, uh, as far as that subject goes, if you ask me, I don't think it's necessarily the fact that we are seeing less of that. I think we do still have it. Like, I just went through the entire Expanse um, novel series. I fi finally finished Leviathan Falls last month, mm. and I can confirm that inner monologue is very much a thing that's still around probably there's a there's a fundamental difference between mr dumas's style and what we have nowadays perhaps perhaps that's where the distinction oh, is sorry, coming sorry. from yeah. just to, just to, just to correct maybe i'm not sure maybe i didn't explain it mm -hmm. this this particular thing is not really a monologue like in a mm -hmm. monologue it's more a narration the narrator is saying uh, oh, as, right. you know, as you know this thing is here all oh, right and that's, that's what you mean. Huh, interesting yeah sorry i probably didn't right. explain it properly uh, gotcha yeah. so as far as the as you know thing that's one of those things that's actually discouraged nowadays mm. it's the reason why you start to see that getting discouraged nowadays because it turns into the whole it kind of feels like the narrator is directly addressing the audience and in a sense mm -hmm. that can kind of break some immer immersion for readers right. like while instead of organically showing us everything you mm -hmm. know going through the motions of the characters seeing it through their eyes it's kind of like the, the, the narrator is pulling you aside to say so uh as yeah. you know yeah and nowadays that gets discouraged and i can see why it does yeah. Because it's more of a show don't tell sort of thing. But the way how I see a lot of writing rules is that they don't necessarily need to be constraints. Yeah. Because yeah. like it's easy for you to um, to kind of de demonize the outside of things, mm. uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be completely off the table either. It really mm. is just a matter of really how you choose to approach it. Mm. Me personally, I don't think I'd ever do it honestly because I prefer to keep the narration entirely within the character's own head. Like, it is clear that someone is kind of describing what they are thinking about, yes, mm -hmm. but it will. But I will never really turn to the whole as-you-know thing because it's a, it's a preference that I personally don't have. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if somebody else wants to do it, then I'd like to see it done in a manner in which it doesn't really break my immersion, let's say. But yeah, I'm sure for possible. Dumas... I'm sure for Dumas, it's fine for the time it was written. And yeah. personally, I've never read The Count of Monte Cristo. I've seen the movies. I've watched the anime Gon Kutsuo, which oh. you should totally watch, by the way, if you haven't seen it already. Like, mm. if you are a fan of the books, some of the some of the relationships that um that go on between the characters, kind of like the bonds that they have and their connections, some of them are either downplayed, missing, or expanded on. It really just depends on what you it really depends on what you want out of it. But just as a warning, if you're going into it, please. Just keep in mind that it is more of a sci -fi, it's a bit of a sci-fi sort of deal so the count kind of looks like a blue vampire that sort of deal ah. oh okay wait a minute is it that one which has that really like 
out there art style like it, it looks yes it's I yeah, yeah. That one. yeah it, okay yeah, it is it is so so freaking fun i love it granted it ain't perfect mm. i can point out a lot of problems i have with the pacing and i feel some characters are dare i say dare i say oh. they kind of chew the scenery just a pitch because if you ask me, the heart of the show really is when the count is out there, is really really is out there just pulling the strings. Which again, that's the point of the whole experience. The count is pulling, is pulling everyone like a puppet. No one, no one, no one really knows his motives until it's far too late for anyone to do anything. Of course, Villefort, from what I understand in the novels, still pre- still pretty fun within the anime. But again, this is coming from someone who hasn't really read the original book yet. Mm. Okay, yeah, I'm only I'm only like just to reach like halfway through it, but I'm really enjoying it. But um, okay, yeah, that that, that kind of put that kind of clicked two and two together in my head because I never heard it before, even before like I saw an and like a clip of it in anime. But um, okay, uh, I'm, I'm definitely going around. I'm definitely going to go and um, consume that media once I'm done with this. Um, yeah, yeah, it just yeah, I just I just it just it just got me thinking. Like, yeah, just about n- narrations and stuff, and and like just about yeah, just even like on the subject of. Um, how we write and why we write differently since like the, between different eras and I think one of the bigger things which I thought was like like obviously back then like obviously the book and that stuff is is it's popular it's you know it's, it's it sells worldwide it does really great regardless of whether you as you knew this place here in the narration like, it don't, I don't think that really is hindering in that you know the book um, much of anything, um, I find I find it, it it kind of brought character. It's like, oh damn, okay, interesting. Although I don't know, it's like I know I don't know this place, but you know, I find it fascinating. Um, so, but I think just it just got me thinking, like maybe the general, like the general reason why it's not really done like that now is simply because, like I think I've just kind of saying, well, like, the world's the world's just kind of gotten like smaller with like we we're just more aware of just like, oh, this book could be read in China, here and here and here and here. And I don't, whether, I don't think we do it, most of us do it consciously, but it's just kind of like, simply just because we kind of can be connected to so many things. We probably like inherently think, oh, if wrong right to other people, it's not just my local area. So I think that's maybe another reason why, if, if there, you know, if most books don't really do that no more, why that's the reason, which is just fascinating. Mind if I say some stuff as well oh, yes, about this? Of course. Yeah. So, uh, well, about uh, what was it? Doing it for, or like, you know, what was it? The audience, right? Mm. Writing for the audience. I remember, or I don't know if this uh, kind of relates, but like when I began writing, it was because like uh, I would imagine a bunch of stories, but I had no one to talk to about it. Uh, and it was just all up in my head. And, it, and I always felt like no one kind of understood me. So I always wanted, I, I, it was like through writing that I like realized, oh, this is how I can express myself in a way. Mm. This is how I can like tell all the stories that I think up in my head and make people understand me in the same level. Yeah. So in, in my case, I would always try to write for the audience in a way to make them kind of understand me. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, nowadays, I mean, I guess, I guess it's still the same. Yeah. But it's like changed a bit. I'm like I'm like thinking. I've I've now started thinking. I want to to focus on writing for myself just as much as I would want to write for the audience. Because I tried that a few times and it just uh, never worked. So it's like you gotta have like I always thought there should be like a balance between yeah, that. Literally, yeah, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. agree. Like yeah, I think there yeah definitely you have to have a balance with that. Like um, like it's basically same story with me. Like I you I think the way I have it in my head is like. I write because it's something I really want to tell. So the story, I think, is, you know, it, it, it gets me it gets me going. I feel like if I can express it in a way to help other people understand that, that feeling and that stuff, then awesome. But, again, you can't, like... So you, you kind of have in mind, okay, there's someone you're trying to explain this to. But at the same time, you don't want to be, like, trying to, like, I guess, be a people pleaser to that person so much. You're just telling the best you can do is, like, hey, let me just tell you this thing, how it is best that I can in my head yeah. explain it to you get this thing out of my head translate it and and I think that's the, like, I think that's the balance you need to have like it's, it's supposed to be coming from you and you you know kind of like just trying to put it in a language they can fully explain it they can take it how they want but um yeah, right. some, people, some people can take it to the extreme where they're trying too hard 
to please the uh, yeah, trying to try, trying to yeah. please the audience, and then you end up not pleasing them. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you know what I mean. You're, you're listening to, especially if you've got like twenty people, you got them to read your thing, and they're saying, "I don't like this. Stop doing this. I don't like that. Stop doing that." You're gonna get contradictory things, and oh yeah, that's uh, exactly. That's yeah. And I wanted to point something. I wanted to talk about another thing since we have mentioned the Count of Monte Cristo mm. as well as the content of the facts that other books can be read from different cultures at this point like yeah. the borders have kind of come down via the internet mm -hmm. so you see within mexico and latin america we have a they have a specific style i shouldn't say we because i'm jamaican and i need to get that straight anyway <laughs> so within latin america we have a particular style of story referred to as magical realism it's basically the idea of everyday life being supplemented by the supernatural or sometimes even the paranormal. Mm -hmm. So basically what you have is a story that really focuses on a lot of real life issues and genuine problems that the culture can identify with. But at the same time, though, it is supplemented by weird happenings. But the weird happenings by themselves are not really the heart of it. It's more of a supplementary aspect of the story. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I bring this up is because one of the more one of the most popular movies out there right now actually incorporates this to a stunning degree that more people are becoming more aware of but they may not necessarily know the cultural background i am of course referring to encanto if anyone's watched that movie you probably have an idea of where i'm going with this because the story of encanto isn't necessarily about the magic by itself everyone within the household has a gift but that's really a backdrop for the fact that mirabelle is a character that's been neglected by her grandmother because fundamentally she is kind of made of made as an other because she's the only child that did not receive a gift from the house which kind of implies that she is likely the end of the line entirely that the miracle is dying and you're and she is inherently getting that pushed on her this can kind of be interpreted um along the lines of the care of um, the family's will and charisma is likely coming to an end and she is something of an omen for that grand fall the mm -hmm. house being enchanted everyone else getting a gift it's a metaphor for just family struggle and just just the idea of your dynasty is drawing its last breath so mm -hmm. the reason why i again brought this up is because even though other cultures will be exposed to what you have written nowadays, or in the story of Encanto's case, even though other cultures may not necessarily be aware of the rich history of magical realism, they can still they can still get along with the themes and the journey at the same time. They may not necessarily know it, but they have an opportunity to go in on a, de on a deeper sense. In that sense, that's why I just don't really think it's wise to compromise whatever vision you may have, even if it does come from a different cultural background native to the land that you're writing in at the moment. At that point, not only does it give your story a specific flavor, but it also allows your audience to engage with that storytelling on a different level that's a little outside of their, as you put it earlier with the, with the field trips, uh, in an extravagant manner. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Can I ask something quickly? Did mm -hmm. you read that off of script? Because that was like super well articulated. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. No. I see that in a good way. <laughs> oh no, no, I. That was one hundred percent off the cuff. I swear. Like I, I did have a literature course about like a year ago, and I kind of went knee deep into magical realism, like they asked, but. I went into it own time all the more. So when Encanto came out, it just brought back all those lectures back into my head, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I literally studied this about a year ago. Jeez. I literally went into this about a year ago, and it, it it it's it wasn't even just a matter of the fact that something I learned in college has actually you know supplemented something in my life. It's more along the lines of, I just love this stuff. I mm. love seeing it. So actually, being able to point to a specific example. Not only feels good, but it kind of just kind of just puts me in a different mode when I um, when I when I'm writing nowadays. It's like you can't really worry too much about whether or not someone isn't going to get it 100 percent because your job as a writer, on top of that, is to ensure that people can get it, that it, to ensure that people can see it. You you may not always see one to one, but if someone can come out with some degree of an interpretation, then. I think you've done your job for what it's worth. Be it positive or negative, you've at least allowed them to feel something. Because if you ask me, art isn't really meant to be quote-unquote non-offensive or non-provocative. 
Because if you ask me, at that point, if your art has to provoke something in people. Well, even if you don't want to call it art, let's just call it your work. Your work has to has to invoke something in someone. Mm-hmm. It can either be positive, it can be negative, but if your work allows someone to feel something, you've done you've done something meaningful. Even if it even if it riles them to anger or, you know, riles or, or just or just makes them feel a little good for a while, that just means that your work has some degree of meaning to it. No, yeah, 100%. Agree. Well stated. Yeah, well, yeah. like, um, it, actually, that got me thinking about, um, yeah, because, like, I think, I've seen it a few places, and I really agree with it. It's, like, writing is, like, people, people crave, creative writers and stuff in the, in, like, the eye of society. They're, like, more on the, the fringes of society. Like, they're on the outside looking in, and then they kind of, like, tr- like, I guess, encapsulate maybe maybe the, the wonkiness or something odd or something maybe maybe probably something uncomfortable about the society or the stuff they witness or see and put it into like a set in a story or artic- articulate sense where it could be it could be digested in a way where it's both in probably entertaining or, in, or or interesting or even funny but then also has an underlying message of hey there's this weird thing in this society or hey this is messed up thing in society i think that's what art essentially is like one of those like one of the like if there was a role, I guess not as a role, but like if there was like a real big thing you could say it can contribute to society, it's that it kind of helps people open their eyes up to maybe something that they either not really paid attention to or 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 something that they just didn't really like think about on like on like the I don't know on the holistic system sense. Like I guess for example, sci fi, a lot of a good deal of sci fi is kinda like us looking into the future, taking one concept of, of what if we, if we do this one thing now and it became like an extreme in the future, like I don't know, well, we choose a really typical one. We use up all our resources on Earth now and way, way into the future, we might be in some, I don't know, dystopian future with resources here running out, we have to go to space and it was all horrible. So let's not do that. Like, that's, I think that's one of the like, biggest things like that you know writing kind of has to offer to society is kind of help people realize like oh yeah maybe maybe we should be paying attention to this so uh... the funny thing about about what you mentioned is that this is something that um the gundam franchise has been banging on about since double um since 1979 and mm. of course 0079 mm-hmm. it's been banging on about that subject of the 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 the, the, lo- the loss of resources the constant downfall of humanity not even just the mm. fact that we are warlike by itself it's simply the fact that we fail to come to an understanding of each other as well as the grand scheme we seem to only think in the short term like mm-hmm. in gundam we'll do things like drop colonies on the earth we'll do things like um we'll we'll oppress the space noids we'll do things like um we'll do things like build nuclear weapons outside of outside of our treaties like all of that stuff <laughs> As weird as it sounds that all of this happens within a series with ridiculous giant robot battles, no disrespect to Gundam intended, (laughs) all of this stuff is scarily real. Mm. All of this stuff is scarily real. It doesn't come from out of nowhere. These warnings and um, cautionary tales are something that we could always point to. Of course, some are better executed than others, a la Fern Gully, the, the, the Magic Rainforest. But as far as it goes... It always turns down to, hey man, does that story have a moral? Hey, does that story have a point? Yeah, it does. And of course, how well that story to um, execute its morals will tend to stay with its people more than others. But mm-hmm. I would hope that, <laughs> I would hope eventually we heed the uh, we heed the warnings of Gundam. Like, hey, if we if we can't come to some degree of an understanding before the world before the Earth some um, minerals and everything else are already depleted then what happens next? I mean, society is already a tenuous concept at best anyway, right? Yeah, I, I've actually been thinking about something like that for a very long time, but that's a, t- a discussion for another day. But something that I wanted to say, because um, I had a discussion with a friend uh, a while back, and the way that this discussion has been going kind of led me back to that one, where he said that, you know, we were, we were talking about art, and he told me that, you know, a writer and writing is sort of like when you're writing your job is sort of to quote unquote sell your ideas 
And when I when I mix that with what was being said in here, I kind of get this message that you, not just writing, but your art, as you said, is sort of sort of a a way to open up. How would I say this? Open up your brain and let the world see what's going on inside, and. I'm trying to put it in a way where it makes sense and doesn't sound like it's just, no. I totally get you. That's like, like perfectly well said. It's it's a <laughs> like way I, like yeah. Open up your brain so that other people can see what's going on in there, and it's a form. I think I still think art is as you because you said that you should invoke something in people. I think that yeah. that's probably one of the things that it should invoke because people should come away with some sort of understanding of at least. You know something that was going on with you or in you or you're trying to show something from yourself whether it's how you view something mm -hmm. what's going on in your life what your take is on something something of you should be within it that the observer i would say in this case because we're talking maybe about you know paintings or writing or whatever so i'll say observer but the observer should come away with something that gives them a better understanding of you as a person, mm. which could lead into better understanding of topics at large. Mm. But I think they're more, you, you know, your take on those topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, they're definitely that. And also just like help them also gain a broader perspective of people as a whole, I believe. Because like, yeah. the more you understand other people and the more you understand their point of view, it's guess you get more of like, I guess a bank or catalog of just how other people are so i don't know it's like it's yeah i don't know art does this i don't know that's why i like it so much because it's like it does so much stuff like firstly it's just you know it could just be entertaining it could be anything it, it doesn't even need to be like the message don't even need to be that deep it could just be something you know what i mean really basic but it's still at the end what well, a good story i feel like it'll leave someone feeling oh okay you know It'll, sh it'll shift something in them whether they should you know it makes them even more optimistic or makes them think more about Especially, like, like I said, like, uh, like, like I say, like, especially with, like a lot of sci-fi, it like makes you think more about like the future and what if this happens and maybe we shouldn't do that, maybe we should do this. Um, and fantasy is kind of like a lot of them are like hero journey. There's you know, obviously there's more there's more nuances to that, but I'm just kind of generalizing right now. But like, a lot of them are like hero journeys, and hero journeys usually um, it's like about someone who goes out to it, like it basically it's basically someone that go out to leave their society to basically face a calamity or dragon or something and come back with a new like a new way to go about life you know what i mean i think essentially if you read to like boil it down so like i think there's like through all like different kind of stories you can kind of like broaden your perspective on just the human experience so i just, I just kind of really do it, so yeah that's interesting. I might look into that actually. Just you know, maybe the amount people just take time to observe art, whether it's sculptures, reading, mm. um, paintings, and stuff. And then you know, I don't know. I wonder what emotional intelligence connections or something like that might be tied into that, yeah. or maybe the ability to understand people. I, I feel like there's something. There may be something there. I'll, I'll probably look into it. Like, that's that's interesting. Even... Yeah, because even like you think about it, like uh, this, this is book I really, really super recommend it. Because the more I look back at it, the more I realize like so much stuff just kind of like clicks from it. It's um I've might have mentioned it a good few times before. Um, I think it's uh Joseph Campbell, a hero of a thousand of a, a hero of, of a thousand faces. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you mentioned that one. Yeah, I mentioned it a good few times. And essentially, yeah. it, it basically I don't know, the best way to basically simplify it is it. Uh, Basically, Joseph Campbell, he went around the world looking at different um, folk tales and stories from religion, from different parts of the country many years ago, and even now, like, tribes and that stuff now who kind of probably, you know, follow their own thing. And these, and even looked at places where these nations were never, they never met, they never seen each other, they never, you know, interacted. And yet, there is a distinct pattern of how we tell our stories. So, and, like, a lot of them, especially back then, well, like again, like there were it's the hero's journey. It's it's a it's it's a done tried and true classic story of you know someone who goes out there into the world 
and brings back like brings back new something new to to the society that helps them advance or go on or become wiser or become closer to you know whatever they see is the great thing in their nation and it just makes it just i don't know it just helps me click like it just helps me click a lot of so many different narratives and stories and stuff and like okay yeah like there is this like there is this no matter where we are in the world even if we're separate and stuff there is essentially this human experience we all kind of share so yeah honestly i think if you want to like really kind of understand a lot of like pat not patterns but yeah like you want to kind of understand a lot of how stories and art and that stuff kind of can you know broaden our, our understanding of people that is a really good book it has so much like references and stuff and um yeah like even even color like, even look at even colors like we have we almost essentially have like um the same sort of we kind of have our same sort of temperament on like colors like essentially usually when we look at like reds we kind of assume to set take you know take that as on like as a, as aggressive or passionate and blue as more like somber and cool and that's kind of almost universal too to a degree there's probably like some slight differences with some colors here and there but like generally there's like there's this pattern here and that was that was out there before before we even like properly interacted with each other so it's really fascinating if you look into it so yeah i'll definitely yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like we have exhausted that topic. Yeah. Can I just mention one small thing, and then maybe we can go on to the next? But um, yeah, I did want to yeah. say something about like the narrator part that you mentioned way way before mm -hmm. about uh, what was it? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the whole narrator how they could kind of take that away the viewer, you know, for kind of like fourth wall breaking. Something yeah, like okay, that. yeah, 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 like kind of like bring you in, like oh, like yeah. you know, as you know this thing, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, I was going to just offhand just mention that I am super guilty of doing that with one of my stories. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. But uh, I when I... Yeah, I don't know. I think, again, um, I know we're of the mind of nothing. There is no real wrong rules. It's just a matter of knowing what you're trying to do, what you're aiming for, and just knowing the tools you're using. I think that's the best thing you can do. And then just knowing, knowing yourself, is that tool the right tool for you? So I, I can't really say, oh, that's a that's a no no or nothing like that because it isn't. If anything, oh. it again, it really just depends on like it depends what you're writing. I, I just I just personally find it interesting because I never really never really came across a story like that said it like so it just it just caught my eye. Like if anything, yeah. Yeah, so so yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing wrong with it. And if anything, I, I'm just I'm just trying to think, like where would that fit? Yeah, but now that uh, it's cool, yeah, generally though, or what was it? Yeah, you could you have a point. Like it's like it depends on the execution. But mm. in the case of mm. what I did, the execution was terrible. I only did it just for the sake of shock value and maybe to maybe to I don't know because I was uh, too young and naive and stuff. Mm. I'd be like that. That's, how, that's I don't know. I I want I don't know. I thought like fourth wall breaking was cool, so I only did things because it was cool or something. But not yeah. never thought about the narrative relevance oh, of yeah. doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. No, in your that. defense, in your defense, I doubt it was anywhere near to the level I've seen it being broken while I was um reviewing books for this. Um, this is so interesting to talk about right now. <laughs> I was I was a part of an of an <laughs> I was part of an of an anime style Don book club on Wattpad. It's oh, just yeah. it's just so weird looking back at that now. So like it's one of the books that I've. Through. Yeah, like, one of the books that I was to read and review, let's just say this guy, like, he literally broke the narrative flow, like, two paragraphs into the story. Like, he's trying to, the narrator is trying to describe the background and everything, what's going on, trying to go into the character's thoughts, and then the character literally is like, Hey, yo, who the hell are you? Nah, man, this is my story. I'm telling it. Hey, man, I'm Dante. I'm like, oh, for God's sake, what have you done? <laughs> like... We're not even two paragraphs into the story, and the main character had already crumpled up and threw the entire narrator right into the trash, and then takes and then takes aim of takes control of the story. Now, in the writer's defense, he told me that well, it really wasn't supposed to be like a novel or anything like that. I'm like, so why the hell did you want us to read this crap? 
I mean, not to sound not to sound mean that you can't do meme projects or anything, but I literally had to do that job so I could actually, you know, mm. provide some tips and assistance where I could. Mm. But that I literally did not know what to do with that book. I really didn't know. Mm. I think I've come to think of it, I think it was one of the last reviews I ever did for that place because it was like that book broke me so bad that I just didn't want to do another one. Oh my gosh. Yeah, like, I understand that. Like not yeah. practicing the purpose of it of it being written, so you taking it seriously and then you're like they're like, Yeah, you're not supposed to take this seriously. You're like, Oh, well, I was ah uh, and then you just kinda brain fried. Yeah, like it it broke me so fast, man. It really did. But oh, God. um on the on that topic, um, I looked at the thread, and there are quite a, there are quite a few questions that we wanted to look over, mm. like um, such as the three act structure. <laughs> Man, that, that 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 one is that one is really funny to think about because the thing about the three act structure is that it's not really a requirement. There are mm. some books from other cultures out there. I can't name any off the top of my head. You're just gonna you're, you're just gonna have to trust me on this one for now because I don't yeah, have the five act structure is one right. Yeah. There's like a five act structure yep. as well, right? Yep. yep. Um, not not that I know of officially, but I wouldn't be surprised because the thing about the three act structure, you know, the whole thing with the begin with the beginning, middle, and end, that does make sense on a practical level, and it is the easiest one to execute overall, honestly, in comparison. But the way how I see it. I don't really feel like your work necessarily has to be confined to it, mm. but in terms of engagement, it is easier for most readers to kind of locate, kind of like localize themselves within the within specific phases of the story. Like, of course, you you need to have an introduction, of course, and you need to have a rising action, of course. Some people do need to feel that semblance of tensions rising, and then where where where, where a climax hits. But there's no law that says that we can't have multiple, that we can't really have multiple um, utterances of the same things happening. By that I mean certain phases occurring again. Like you can have like a introduction to a specific set of happenings again. Then you can have a rising action for that portion, and then you can have a climax for that section again. There's not necessarily anything that states that a book needs to ha only have one of each. You can literally go with as many... I need to stop saying literally today. My my friend sent me a Leafy is Here video from way back when because he wanted to shoot the breeze on nostalgia. But <laughs> what I'm where, where I'm going is... Where I'm going with this is, there really isn't anything to confine you from really going outside of the three-act structure if you'd like to. It really is just a matter of engagement and ensuring that the, that the reader's time does not feel wasted. Now, m now, me personally, if you were to ask if I use the three act structure, that's a bit of a that that's a bit of a hard yes. But the reason why the reason why I'm a little hesitant on that is because I've gotten to the point where this little prequel art that I wound up doing for this has wound up going up to like fifty chapters, and I do need to start cutting some more stuff out. But I'd like to think that I'm still well within the three act structure. But at the same time, though, if I choose to kind of merge the two books together. Or rather, just merge the original arc that I had before I went out to write this prequel arc, because I'm not even sure if I want to separate them at all. I might have a thing where it's like I don't really have the traditional three arc, uh, three act structure going at this point. I might not if I do it this way. Mm. Now that doesn't necessarily make me a cut above or particularly unique as a writer or anything. I don't mm. think it does. I just think it's a matter of you need like you need you can be aware of. You can be aware of the various "quote unquote" standards that are out there. You mm. can be aware of all of them, and you can write to those standards. And there's nothing wrong with it. There isn't anything wrong with it. And I don't even think this is um, by itself a, a necessary matter of execution. I feel this is more of: Do you have a story to tell? Okay, so you need to tell that story through any through every means possible, every means that you can. If you wind up going against the three act structure in some shape or form. That's not inherently a bad thing. It mm. isn't. You really just need to ensure that, that that the reader can stay engaged. You need to you need to make sure that you're still re that you're rewarding them for paying attention. You they may they may not in fact if they find themselves that they're not if they're not able to tell at which point in the three act structure that they're in, 
you might be introducing them into new territory, something they've probably never seen before. You might be bringing them into some new territory. So at that point, you need all you need to ensure is that the time that they're spending with your work feels rewarded with every other chapter that they're reading. Like, did they catch on a detail mentioned earlier that comes back? And before the character even figures it out, do they figure it out? If that's the case, then I feel the three act structure in and of itself is a fine blueprint. Yeah. But it but it by itself doesn't need to restrict you. You you can use it, but I don't think it should be a restriction to you either. If anything, the best part of being a writer is that semblance of freedom. Like if you need to tell your story, do everything you can in your power to tell that story. The the three act structure should never be a limiter but it should be a blueprint for you to phase your story around where it counts. Yeah. And hey, if you find out that you're going beyond it, well, you don't have to scrap the whole thing. Yeah. Just take a take a good look at where you're going. Do you feel do you feel the do you feel the reader is going to be rewarded if they keep going? If so, then ensure that the parts that um that do that uh, are supposed to be rewarding do feel that way. Mm. Mm. No, I 100% agree. Yeah, you pretty much touched a lot upon what I was I was, was going to say. I'll just guess I'll add to it as um, I've gone through a lot, quite a few books that talk about structures and, you know, three-act structures, five-act structures. There's, a, there's a, quite a few of them. But what it really comes down to, because you can use not you can not just use it writing on your, on your story. You can also use it to analyse other stories. And what the interesting thing is, is that, like I said, it's a blueprint. And because of that, it's more just to, it's not so much, oh, you must have this thing here, you must have this thing here. It's more like, typically, there is usually a, 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 a you know, rise in action here. And usually there's, you know, there's the dark, dark thing to the soul. Of course, it's called hair. But what you can find is, you can find, if you really want to, with most, a lot of shows and stories, you can find a free act structure in it. And then you can find a five act structure in it, and you can find a seven act structure in it to so somewhere or another. Some will probably fit more comfortably in there than others, because maybe the writer was more attention with you think than others. Again, like you were kind of saying, these are not like, oh, the these are the rules on how to do it. It's just, it's just a way to help. I think that's yeah. It's like it's a blueprint, which is just which is basically means it's just it's a, it's a skeleton, a rough skeleton to help you kind of I don't know, add the meat. And know where to put, you know, you know, certain parts of your of your of the dish you're making, I suppose. Um, so yeah, you should never, never be like limited to it. You can you can easily, you can easily look at your own story. You can you could probably scrutinize under three act structure, see some patterns. Scrutinize under five act structure, see some patterns. The only thing is, I guess, the best thing it really does is it just gives you a general sense of are you. Are you on, you know, are you on a path that typically works? That's the best thing you can re it, it really does. It's just, are you on a path that typically works? Um, but again, most, you know, it's not, it's not a thing you have to like, you have to follow. It's good. To, I think the best thing to do is like, I think of all things, that's how I see every single thing you're doing writing is they're just they're all tools. They're all just tools. And you just got to use the parts of you know use the tools you feel you need in the certain situation you have to you know to get the story you want and the more tools and more stuff you understand the more i guess the more stuff you have in your kit to kind of more quicker figure out what's wrong with your story so whereas whereas if you didn't have the idea you didn't even know the concept of structures and you had a problem you'd be like oh gosh what should i do there's a problem here but maybe if you had you know if you understood about structure you'd be like oh i can you screw that under this structure oh i see this might be the problem because it helps just kind of just helps maybe narrow yourself in into maybe beats that are typically found in most stories so yeah it's just they're just they're just tools they're just tools and you should just treat them as such when you're right don't be don't be don't be beholden to them if any i just say if anything just like learn them more if possible no 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 all the tools so you just have you know you have more more stuff in your kit to actually tackle your own story and then the more you understand them then the more you can not just maybe follow them if you feel it works for you you can also you can also bend the rules because now you know because now you know what they are and how they are why they work so yeah yeah i was actually um i have two things to say on that one that the the tools part you know i think is really important that's why i say that if you want to write 
Uh, and, and I always say that the best, my personal thing that I do is my, my, when I want to improve at writing, I read and I analyze because the, the more that I can f- convince myself of why something works or doesn't work, the better I have an understanding of myself and how I want to portray certain things. Mm. So I understand what you're talking about in terms of the tools. Um, instead of, you know, just looking at hard tools, it's more of, well, how did this apply here? How did they do it here? And what do I have problems with or something like that? But the other thing is that I, I, personally, I'm having a bit of trouble with understanding the three act structure, just because it's always been something vague to me. Not that I'm like, I have a problem with how it's described. I personally struggle with what the three act structure is supposed to be. Cause I understand, I understand that there's Freytag's pyramid, there's Kisho Tenketsu, but then the three act structure has always been confusing outside of beginning, middle and end. Cause mm. I never understood what that actually was supposed to mean or what's inside of it versus Freytag's pyramid and Kisha Tenketsu. They actually sort of define what's in their different phases. But mm. if anybody would like to, you know, I think help like, me out here. I think like, what was it? You say, you say that it's vague, right? So it's like maybe it was made that way. It was designed that, that way so that you can kind of, uh it's like yeah like many of you said it's like a blueprint where you can just you can you can tweak it to your liking to fit the story structure in a way um but i don't have much more to add to this aside from like i i'm i'm in a similar place with uh willpower or wilson in the sense that to to me as well uh the three x structure is very vague and whenever i would write stories i actually I don't know if I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't totally follow it. It was may, maybe it was uh, maybe if I were to look back, it was more like I would um, subconsciously follow it, but I would never actively follow. I would just write the story. I would have a beginning, a, a, a like conflict, and then and then a climax to it. Uh, it could be. It could be that I, I learned that from like you know how schools always teach you the three act structure and stuff. But I, it's like uh, usually when I do begin a story, when, when I was uh, what was it? When I was a little bit younger and starting to write more, at that time, uh, I would never actively follow the three act structure. I would just write based on feeling, and how the story should should go. But nowadays, in the present day, I do actually kind of think about uh, the, the how should I structure my story, and I that's why like uh, nowadays I don't write much, but I am doing a, just a lot of planning and thinking of new ideas on how I could uh, uh, write write my uh, story that I have in mind. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I've kind of come to find that within character-oriented stories, at least on my end, is that me trying to stick to the three-act structure hasn't really done me any favors. Again, that's not a strike against it. It's just fine for for your purposes if that's what you want to stick to but i found that when i stuck to that i was kind of cheapening out on character development because there's going to be there are multiple times in people's lives where they get confronted with certain realities that wind up changing their worldview like there of course you can argue that there's always a rising action there's always an introduction to a problem a rising action of the issue then the climax and then the rolling off at that point we can kind of apply that to a character arc as well like where they start their their beliefs and motivations are being challenged the emotional high point the breaking point etc we do have we do have that kind of structure as well at least that's the one that i have been leaning towards since i started really going ham on what i'm working on right now so i found that i found that 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 structure is a lot easier for me to work with of course, there is. Of course, there, that does lead to a problem of maybe of the plot potentially getting a little meandering. That there is that issue too. But if your characters are really at the spotlight of everything, then the typical three act structure need, may need not apply to some people. Because at the end of the day, if your characters' evolution and changes, as well as the changes of other people involved, are really what's at the heart of it, then 
you can kind of you can kind of experiment with um with ideas and structures outside of what's of what of what's typically recommended to you. If you can make it work all on your own, then there then you can have it. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I thought I'm just thinking because. Yeah, free act structure. I think typically what is really what free act structure is really um analyzing, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a minute since I really like super analyzed it, is basically just the tension in the story throughout. So you obviously at the beginning where that's where typically the least tension is. And then and then there's, you know, there's the rise in act, you know, there's the rise in action when obviously, you know, the plot starts kicking after everything's kind of introduced. And after you know, it, there's a tension that kind of rises and then around the middle point, it kind of it kind of meanders and it's, it's kind of like it's things are building up but it's just kind of like i no, i think i'm mixing two i think i'm mixing two like structures together because because the free extra structure from what i understand it's just really checking the checking the tension of the of the story through the beginning middle and end and then you can kind of graft on top of other structures which kind of have more like defi definitive names um so so yeah, like I think the free act, and then also, so yeah, in that sense, it's really basic. But then when you think about it as well, each scene, it's its own free act structure. If you if you really get down to it, exactly, so, yeah, so, exactly. So that, that, that's that's when the that's when the little more I guess the nuance complexity goes with that basic. So even that basic template, you can make it. It's more and and I want. Thing, you know, so, yeah. and, and I want to add something to that too. Like every scene can be its own three act structure, and um, it can also be its own battle on top of that. Like I don't necessarily mean by physical. I mean by it can be a battle of of words. Like yeah, a debate. Exactly. It can be like a battle of words um, or a debate, as we put it here. Like one of the things that I love about like um this this isn't really a written story it's a game but Final Fantasy Tactics is great you should totally get into that you see there are, every other scene in Final Fantasy Tactics features at least two or three characters in one scene and there's always a matter of the upper hand belonging to one character you think that the main bad guy of the game well Tactics has several enemies but still there's a moment where there, the the main enemy of the game He's kind of talking down to this one duke who he assumes knows nothing, right? But he comes to realize that this duke is a lot more capable than he lets on. So the upper hand switches to the duke who seems to be completely unaware of the conspiracy before it falls back into the hands of the guy who's actually leading said conspiracy. So it it can turn into a matter of somebody may seem to have all the cards in their in the in the palm of their hands, but the conversation goes back and forth between you get where this is going. You start to see who has the um, who has the main point to stand on. Then that person's main point gets torn to pieces because they either underestimated the point of the other person, or the other person just so happens to have a more compelling argument, or manages to convince the audience that they know more than more than their than their opponent at the time. So it's kind of like. Every act can be its own three act structure, mm -hmm. and every moment of dialogue can be a conflict or a fight in and of itself. It doesn't right. necessarily have to be two characters talking to one another, but the wordplay can be just as elegant as any duel, if you ask me. Mm. Well, I, I mean, to add to that, oh sorry, oh, yeah. no, or... no, 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 I'm just saying, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. To add to that, I have I like thought of when you brought up the whole Final Fantasy tactics oh. and the whole like yeah battle of words. It it made me think of like other other. Uh, media that also that also use this tactic um what was it silence of the lambs if you've ever seen that or if you've ever heard of that yeah. yeah so so i remember like in the beginning or i watched like, like a film analysis of it where like they talked about the beginning when they first when the female character first meets actor right and how the whole scene focuses on how uh you know the camera zooms in and or like how like he has a lot of power in this scene through his words alone like he just has a lot of power over over the female character uh, i forgot her name <laughs> but um but then like as it as it slowly slowly builds up the tension and and it reaches the climax uh, the the uh, the female character gets the upper hand in the discussion and suddenly he kind of backs off a bit uh and it's like really well displayed through the cinematography and everything but mainly also the writing yeah. as so I want to have that as an example. Uh, another example is from like an anime called Babylon, where there was an interrogation scene between uh, the main character, who's a detective, and this uh, one suspect woman. 
and the way uh, this dialogue went, it was uh, kind of similar in the sense of like the tensity between like this woman who's basically the main villain and like this detective and them trying to like figure each other out. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add something to like the examples that you gave. Yeah, no, yeah, like um, that's why I think like a good, good, good dialogue is a battle in its own right. To be honest, so yeah, that just that that totally fits. I guess it kind of segueing is sideways to like, especially in Shonen, they do this a lot. Where a lot of I've, I've said this in a video, <laughs> I've said this in a video, so I think we might mention this before. But like a lot of the battles in Shonen, you know, it's they are basically the conversation. Like you notice, like the person who usually has the upper hand is the one who's winning the winning the the the, the argument they probably all disagreement have with each other. Um, in Naruto, they almost they basically explicitly say this. They say like high level shinobi could talk to each other with their fists without saying a word, and uh, yeah. So just like again, like yeah, um, a lot of the writing battles is like yeah, is a, it can be a conversation and battles themselves can be a conversation of of conflict in in its own right. The, just medium, you know, different medium kind of deal with it differently. But um, yeah, just I find it kind of interesting that. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but uh, I just want to ask, right, we have this list, but do we have to follow it strictly, or can we... Can I have no, an no, idea no, for a um, subject that we can talk about? No, we no, can no, definitely... No. Yeah, I think we can break um, We can break the linearity if we'd like to. Like, you yeah. can basically jump into it. Mm. Any one of us. I'll just react structure at the time, because I just thought that was a little bit relevant to what we've already been going over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to be kind of a tangent. But this was like the first thing that came to my mind, bef like before we even like started the podcast uh, as like a a subject. Mm. But um, what do you think of uh, music influencing the way you write your stories? Because uh, uh, <laughs> that's a hell of a topic, and I love it. Yeah, I... yeah. Because for me, or sorry, I'll I'll go first, and then I'll let everyone talk. Because I love I love talking about this. Uh, to me, um, what was it when I was younger? Uh, I don't think. Uh, uh, music had a lot of impact on me, but I never really appreciate it like I do now. Like now, I realize like music had a much has a very big impact on me as a writer, and I think like majority of my like imagination and majority of my ideas come from music. And I and I oftentimes like try to uh, have a very open mind to different kind of music. I sometimes I love mm. listening to orchestra. Sometimes you know even dubstep. Sometimes like EDM. Majority of the time I actually prefer EDM. But uh, I'll even listen to guitar. Uh, I think video game music has a lot of influence as well. Yeah, uh, for me, video game music is so underrated. Yeah, <laughs> like, like what is it? Like, you know when people say what kind of music you listen to, right? And I always wanted to say I, I, I want I want the I want it to be a norm to say that I like to listen to video game music. I want that to be a norm, okay? And people not to look at me weird. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Music is top tier. Yeah, yeah. 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 Here to my passion of my voice, because, <laughs> like uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like if you were to walk into my room right now, you probably can't hear it because of the way how my headphones are set up. But I blast video game music like literally every day in this room. Like it never fails. One day I'll be listening to the original soundtrack from Fantasy Star Two. I will be listening to the to a compilation remix from someone, or I will be listening to some of my favorite music from Yoko Shinobu. Mora. If you don't know who that is, that is a composer Broke behind the Kingdom Hearts series. Yeah. Now, I I never write my, I never write without music. That's just how it goes. Like, and the way how um Hex says it, yeah, music is something that directly influences this is us whether we're not there are some people out there who will literally make well not even some people we all do this as writers we need to listen to some music to get us pumped up for a good fight we do that we need music to set the mood and all of the above mm -hmm. now but even but but i think it goes beyond that for me because um when i heard the soundtrack for radiant historia from yoko shinomura that was one of the things that woke something up in me. That it woke me up to the kind of story I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell a a melancholy story, like a story of war and what it really means. Not the not the romanticism of it all. Not the not the the heroic stories, but more of the tales of what does war really mean for those who are really trapped in it. What does it mean for those who have already who um, who've lost something as a response to that. 
whenever I hear a string track from from Shinomura, I'm always feeling all of those emotions at once. That's why whenever I was still posting my stuff on Wattpad, nine times out of ten, the music that you would find in the music section was from Shinomura, because I feel that is really what communicates the heart of what I write. Mm. Of course, there is another particular band that I do listen to. It's Sound Horizon or Linked Horizon. If you know Attack on Titan, you definitely know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Revo. I am mm. a huge fan of their orchestral sound. But not only that, if you've if you've gone into into the into the discography, you're going to find that a lot of their music actually tells stories. Mm. A lot of their music are literally stories that you could see on a stage play. And if you and if you want to take it a step further, if you've seen any of their concerts, all of the all of the all of the performers, dancers, and and um, and instrumentalists, they all have something. They all have a costume on. They all do. So they're not even just singing you a song. They're also telling you a story in between all of that. In fact, the name of my story literally comes from one of from one of their songs. If that doesn't tell you how knee deep in I am into believing that video game music as well as music in general just really speaks to the writer, I don't know what more I can tell you, man, because it's just inherent. Yeah, I wanted to actually talk about my experience because that's actually the majority of the the scenes or, or the story that I'm writing comes from just music in general. Um when I listen to music, sometimes scenes just pop into my head and I'm like, oh, this kind of fits here or this is mm. kind of telling me this. Because I I, uh, I don't know if I've ever said this here, but I was in orchestra. I played the cello for oh hell yeah. oh, eight wow. years, played the cello for a very long time. So I was kind of a little deep into that kind of stuff and how music worked. And one thing that I was always really interested in is how music was able to evoke emotion, how certain sounds or certain melodies evoke emotions from people. And I always thought that that was really cool. I, I haven't really found any substantial research into it because it's so abstract. But on the topic of that, um, I think that, you know, just just that connection that you have to music, but also that connection that you are able to see parallel scenes that you may have seen before associated with music in the past sort of lets you craft scenes similar in your head if you hear a song that makes you feel a similar way. I don't know if I'm describing that well or if anybody can relate to that, but... That's that's sort of what I was getting at with how it was being described is that like you hear certain types of music that you associate with something and then you hear another song that makes you feel like, for example, I his name escapes me. I don't know why his name escapes me, but I know pretty much all of us here have played um, the Souls games. Mm. And Miyamoto, I think. Yeah. Miyamoto. No, no, not Miyamoto. No. Sorry. Do you mean the composer of the game, or just uh, no? The, the game not not the not Miyazaki. The yeah, the, the composer. composer. Oh, I'm trying oh, to remember. Okay. Never mind. Because there's two, there's two of them. You're, are you referring to Sakuraba, Matoi Sakuraba? I'm gonna check right now because I'm checking do, on my phone. Yeah, I, and and, and Kitamura. Mm. Actually, there's three. Mm. There's Suzuki as well. My goodness. <laughs> But when I listen to when I listen to a lot of the boss soundtracks, like a lot of times the boss soundtracks, yeah, they were often iconic to the boss. Like in Dark Souls games or any Soulsborne game, you hear the boss music pretty much. You are able to re remember your specific experience with that boss fight. That's a weird phenomenon, but I can I have like nothing to back it up. But it just feels so strongly about it. It's like I hear this certain song, I'm like, oh, I remember how many times he killed me, or I remember this fight, or something like that. But mm. I think there's a, and maybe it's, maybe there's an, a, cer a certain attachment that certain sounds have. But a lot of the times, the music themselves not only set the the feel, but oftentimes I could get a, a an understanding of 
the boss that I was fighting and who they once were or how they ended up the way they are. Um, and hmm. it's so hard. I try to say something about an idea that is I can only sort of feel, can't really explain. Yeah. And I think because it invokes um, that music, it basically like helps invoke like certain emotions. Because like the way it is, I think it's like a really well done track is basically a story condensed into feeling. And when <clears throat> we we are creatures who you know we think obviously as well but we feel too and essentially that's where most of the decisions decisions come from it's feeling so if you have something that can like speak to that in even though we don't speak in a language it's quite universal that's why I, you can listen to something from the other side of the world and you'll still kind of catch that feeling even if the cultural instruments and stuff is alien to you because yeah, because it's just, it's it gets so quick, it gets so to the core of like, yeah, it gets so to the core of like what we are, as, you know, as creatures, we are like exactly creatures are feeling. So that's, that's like... the official reason why. And then also, I think with especially, I've noticed what well, I think that's the reason why game music is so cool is like because by design they have to what is compared to like especially compared to like contemporary music or 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 like especially or TV show music. It's most TV shows, music and central music. It has they have the three act structure basically: the beginning, middle, and end. At best, TV show ones they they can literally just like they kind of have maybe maybe follow along with what's going on on the screen, which is yeah, that works. But then it does it. It works in that show. But then if you take it out and listen to myself, it just sounds oh, it's just it doesn't really have like a a a, a pattern of. Or it doesn't really have its own character. Whereas video game music, essentially by design, has to be a loop, and then it has to encap not just be a loop. It has to encapsulate a moment or a thing or a or an atmosphere in that loop. So it has to become literally its own character instead of just like instead of just like a through line from one end to another or invoking a little or being a little movie. It has to be a, a whole. It has to be a whole like its own sort of character. I think that's the reason why why they i think they stick in my head so much more like compared to like ever most contemporary things because it has to be yeah it's designed has to be a, it has to be a loop so then so it just it, it, i think essentially on the surface it's more work because it's just like oh we can't just make a thing beginning middle end and kind of you know be done it has to it has to kind of ring back in, into itself and become this full thing i don't know i'm not, not sure we explain it too well but i mean that's one reason why i think music and music kind of is really especially when it's done really well it's, it's it really just stands out as like really good pieces you can listen to on its own because it's meant by design it's meant to be able to stand up on its own yeah, yeah uh what was it i feel like wilson uh wilson and i or at least Wilson, for I can relate so much with you, or like the the way you describe stuff, it like relates, it like resonates with me really well, because it's like basically the same scenario. Uh, the way you describe like how most of your story is like based on the music, it's like mm. for me as well. Like majority of my story is like based on um, the music that I listen to, and sometimes uh, sometimes there I find a music that fits well with a scenario, and other times. I'll listen to a music and it will make me think up of a scenario for my for my uh, for my story. Uh, it's like it's like I don't know. It's uh, super influential. I also want to just offhand add that um, this is this is gonna be maybe this is like a small hot take, but uh, I prefer music without lyrics uh, more often than music because to me yeah. whenever whenever there's no lyrics i can kind of um, it's more like you can interpret uh, mm -hmm. the meaning of the song yourself and you can imagine yeah. you're you're more free to imagine you can imprint your when, own sort of you can print your own sort of like uh take on it over yeah it just kind of telling you more more or less what it should feel yeah. um I think, exactly I think, I think actually funny enough, i think that's the reason why i like foreign and stuff like Jap i think i like japanese ones more as well it's probably not just because i'm a weeb it's probably just because probably because most of the time i just do, i don't i don't fully understand what they're saying but because of that i have to rely more on it's, it's kind of like it's, i guess it's kind of like when you lose a sense like if you lose your sight apparently other senses get stronger or more aware so since because i don't understand 
don't understand fully what they're saying. I'm more acute to the actual what it's trying to what it's trying to tell me through feeling. So then it's like I think it just comes a bit across a bit more stronger sometimes. Yeah, yeah. it's like what was it? It's like it's um it's a a very good example is actually if you've ever listened to near automata or near oh, replicant yeah. soundtrack because um the language that they use in in the song in the music is actually made up yes yeah, yeah. So it's, it's the chaos language the chaos speculative language. language of what we're expected to speak in the next in the next thousand years or so mm. it's yeah. It's a blend it's, of German, Finnish, French, and several other languages. Yeah, I think it's like even Spanish is mixed in a bit. German, Finnish, Spanish. Uh, yeah, like yeah. Fact, it's, uh, can, yeah. There is another example of this. Like, if you're familiar with composer um, Yuki Kajura, she does the same thing in hers. Like, if you know, let's see, if you know Fate Zero, Karano Kyokai. Yeah. Mm. or any or most of anything that Ufotable has done or most notably Subasa mm. all of the lyrics in those songs are completely made up and according to Shinomura the only way to translate them is really based on what the music makes you feel exactly it, it, that's mm. basically her explanation of it like yeah. El Cazador de la Bruja is far from my is far from what I would consider a really good anime but its soundtrack is so damn good like mm. Like, do this for me. If you have a chance, go go look up Inca Rose from El Cazador, and you listen to that. You tell me how that song makes you feel, because it is so damn beautiful. Like, for a moment, mm. I was assuming that I was listening to a song that was in complete Spanish. It sounds like it's in Spanish, but it isn't. Completely made up. It sounds like it is, based on the dialect that you're hearing. But it's a... It's a Beautiful tune. Give it a listen if you haven't already. While a lot of the sound, a lot of the shows that Yuki Kajura composed for back in the day, like Madlax, El Cazador, and Noir, may not have been the best in terms of storytelling or even directorial, depending on how you feel. The music is freaking powerful. I have the soundtrack on my PC for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, now speaking of that, yeah, it's funny because, like, again, because like music and that stuff is kind of essentially really boiling down the emotions or it's basically boiling down like a narrative into emotions yeah it's funny when you it's interesting when you find like a really bad show or game like i don't know sonic 06 and then you look at the soundtrack and it kind of gives you an idea of what they're probably going for compared to the artist to the, compared to how the result of the actual art itself came out it's really cool. Yeah, yeah especially it's, with Sonic 06. Oh, yeah. Sonic sorry. 06 <laughs> is such an awful game, but its soundtrack is. Oh my gosh, that was so good! You brought back oh so my many God. <laughs> terrible love hate memories. Yeah. His girl slaps. I used to just listen. To, I used to just turn on the game and go to areas just so I could hear the music because I sucked at YouTube back then. But then I would play the game and I'd be like, oh my god. I, I used to hate running. Like, you know how Sonic has its iconic loops? Yeah. I used to hate running on loops and then just stopping. That was the most annoying thing ever in a Sonic game. Yeah. And also, okay. Uh, can, can I ask this question? Because, like, when I. Because I played Sonic 06, yeah. But I must be very lucky, or I must be very actually not. Nah, I did. I don't know. I didn't get any big brain game breaking bugs. I just kind of got oh, knuckles just thrown off the wall a bit, and Rose just thrown off the wall a bit, and I don't know. The ball bit was a bit weird. Well, you know that silver ball thing you got. I don't know. I never really had like it was not until I went on the internet and saw how buggy it was. I'm like, oh, this game is is panned. Like yeah, I just, like I just yeah, I, I never the, played it. The, the most the most I felt was. Oh, this game looks awesome because it was obviously it was the first like next gen sort of Sonic game at the time. But I thought besides I thought besides some control things feeling a bit lacking compared to the older games, it felt I don't know. I had I had a decent experience. I so, thought the worlds were pretty amazing too. Not yeah. as good as I still think Sonic I, I I had the most fun with the worlds of Sonic Heroes, just because they were all so different from one another. But Sonic 06 had some really awesome locations to be in are you excited for the new sonic game sonic frontier um i haven't kept up with sonic in a bit just because i get busy and there's only so many games i can keep up with right now it's dying light and yeah. Elden Ring. 
Elden Ring and Elden. GTA 6 just got announced. So yeah, how about that? Be keeping up with that too. Oh yeah. my gosh, that's but I, I do want to say something in response to Faker because um, oh. he said that you prefer music without lyrics, and um, I don't think that's a hot take. I know a lot of as you saw there. Are people in here that did agree with you i personally though don't have a preference and here's right. why um a lot of times music without lyrics is similar to i treat it similar to stories in the way that the story doesn't always t like the show don't tell basically what they're saying doesn't have to be what is actually being said and you can take those lyrics and apply them to certain situations and say that oh somebody who is experiencing this could probably make this song or something like that that's sort of how because when i listen to song lyrics sometimes i'll listen to the to the lyrics and the lyrics are like oh if somebody was living this life this is something they would probably say or this is the journey they would probably go through and it doesn't have to be what the lyrics are saying directly to me but the lyrics provide me a sort of map mm. of someone's interpretations of something. And then I can kind of create my own idea of what that something is, if you get me. Yeah, yeah I guess it puts more like, uh, I guess, like checkpoints on whatever they're trying to invoke on, on, on there, isn't it? That's what I think it's yeah. Like, yeah. I was gonna. I was gonna add that. Um, yeah, I said. I said I prefer, but that doesn't mean I completely neglect uh, lyrical music. There are oh, like okay. a few exceptions, of course. Uh, of course, like near near music, but also like other music um, that have vocals in them. Uh, but I do want to just offhand, just quickly, just say that um, Ace Combat has like really good music. That and it does actually. <laughs> And Ace Combat is the first game that I've ever played that no that I've ever I've, I've played it, but it's the first game that I've ever wanted to play solely because the music was so good. Like I I remember watching the first like trailer, E3 trailer or like uh, something like that, and I heard that music and it stuck in my head and I was like obsessed with it. I was like I, w I want this music. I wanna <laughs> I wanna listen to it. And uh, and slowly slowly as I listened to more music. From the album in in uh, yeah on YouTube, I eventually was just convinced that I, I want to play this game. Uh, so and uh, when I did, it like it like my experience was like ten times better because um, the music is great, but the story and like with the gameplay and everything, it just it like lifts everything up and makes it all better together. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a really good transition point to um, this one question: how to convey emotion without being heavy-handed. That's a nice. Mm. I think that's a that's a good that's a good transition. We could talk about yeah, that. That's good. So I'll 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 go at it first. So I have watched. I have a I, quick I, question. Sorry. Oh, go on. Yeah. Um. I'm thinking just because like a lot of these questions came from people that we didn't directly interact with so they may be using or having implied definitions that so I, I just wanted to say that what what sort of what is what kind of what are we going to use for heavy-handed right because like when it comes to heavy-handed it can mean a lot like are we talking about like are we trying too hard for this to come across as emotional when it's it honestly just doesn't mean anything in the reader's perspective like it might mean something to the characters but the reader can't necessarily connect then there's also the problem of melodrama mm. which yeah. is when be some sense of emotion but it might be going over the top to the point where it just registers as white noise so i think we can kind of go with the white noise definition for this one okay since it might feel as it might not necessarily feel authentic so if i had to talk about how to go about writing emotional scenes if I were coming across as heavy-handed. It's making sure that we, as the audience, can get into the characters' heads so we know how they feel. But at the same time, though, it's ensuring that the narrative is strong enough to stand without it feeling, without it feeling either A, manipulative, or B, pretty 
how how do I describe it? Forced, because mm. like sadness and um, sadness and emotional moments, they can vary from person to person. They can vary from person to person, as everyone has a different means of communicating with communicating or responding to a harsh situation or a harsh reality. Everyone has a different way of responding to it. So that means everyone's response is not going to be the same thing. Some people handle death differently. Some people handle tragedies differently. But I think the universally agreed opinion is that if it feels like it's a Spanish drama and everyone is screaming, Por qué? Por qué? You probably screwed up somewhere. You probably <laughs> dropped the ball somewhere along the way. That's likely what's happened here. Mm. So what we need to do in order to make sure that we don't have this problem it's not necessarily to play it up to the highest point. It's allow the story to progress as it always has up till now. Mm. Like, allow the story's voice to communicate what's going on. Not without trying to make you feel bad per se. You as, a, you as, a, as the audience don't need to feel bad or feel bad for the character alone for a scene to be emotional. You just need to be right there with them in the moment for you to feel that way. Like... Let's say, for example, your character has been lied to from the moment the story opened up, and they find out they find out the truth behind all of those lies. How do you feel the character is going to feel in that instance? If they've built a life of trust with these people who've done nothing but lie to them at this point, what do you think that's going to do to them? That's mm -hmm. going to harm their ability to communicate with, um, with those people in question or to ever open up again as a person. Like, what are they thinking of? What's the inner monologue like? What are they thinking and what are they feeling? I mean, yes, you can have them crying, right? But what are they thinking about? You can communicate how they're feeling inside without just mentioning how sad they are. Mm. It's just a matter of how they're going to react and respond to the situation at hand. Now, since we've been talking about video games a lot, there's a reason why the stories of Nier and Nier Automata really hit people hard emotionally. Because we come to understand the struggles of each, an individ of each individual character. Nier is motivated by his want to save his sister, but along the way, he kind of has, has to come to the terms of the fact that, that, that what he's going to end up doing along the way is that he winds up killing a lot of shades. But when he's eventually confronted about this, he mentions that he's not going to cry, he's not going to mourn, he's not going to feel any sympathy, because he swore that he would strike down anyone who came, who came, in, the way of, who came in the way of his goal. So it's not necessarily near that we need to feel bad for in his pursuits by itself. No, we also need to feel, we also need to feel some semblance of empathy and some semblance of hurt for the people that he winds up striking down, because ironically... The reason why Nier hits us hard isn't because the characters in question who are suffering, it's because, god damn, I can feel that. I can actually feel that. That shade that you wound up killing at the beginning of the story, that was a child. Now, it's not necessarily meant to make you feel bad, but not necessarily make, bad, made to make you feel bad on its own, but it's, it's there to remind you that this world is cruel. So it doesn't necessarily need to be emotional or sad for the sake of making you feel bad. It's It should serve as a reminder that the world that we're in is a cruel one, but it can also be a beautiful place on top of it because you have genuinely good people. It's just that along the way, they're forced to make some really ugly and bad choices. Mm. If you ask me, emotional does not necessarily mean, need to mean sad. It really just needs to mean... It's a it's a wide it's a wide range of emotions that you can feel. Sadness is not necessarily the default for this situation. Yeah, I actually because I, I people when they think of emotional always default sadness or dark, and I always felt like you know we we experience a lot more emotions than that. But I wanted to piggyback on about the empathy part. I think that's really important. I think our I think something that's really important is you need to create a sort of conduit for us to be able to understand what this character is going through and really get a good idea of how they're interpreting everything that they're going through um, and why they're interpreting it that way. I think one time I, I was having a discussion with a friend and I was like, how, I was like, somebody brought up the the term subtle tragedy and i was like what is a subtle tragedy and so i thought about it for a while and i was like you know 
a subtle tragedy is really um, not the event, but how the character interprets it and internalizes it and what they become afterwards. Um, because you can put characters in the same event, but they come out differently from it. And that's why, as you said before, that we really need to get into this character's head, see what they're thinking, why they're thinking that. It doesn't have to be crying, warning, or something like that, but something as simple as you know, sitting, sitting down and thinking and taking a deep sigh. And that deep sigh meaning that you know, this character is so overwhelmed that all they can do is sit down and shut down. Like that That's a really powerful emotion to evoke, you know, mm. especially for a character who maybe throughout the story has always seemed like they could handle everything. Yeah. Um, right. And that's, when the, and that's when we write the breaking point for exactly. that character. Like... Exactly. Because, like, um, just to use another example, um, now this is going to be another personal example from me and my writing. My, one of my characters throughout the entire book has had a specific philosophy. Whereas most of her enemies seem to really care about this idea of a grand future, a state that governs the future, they don't really seem to think too much about its people. The people are a little more than, aesthetic, than an aesthetic for their purposes. My lead character, however, really does care about ensuring that these peop that people do not die, but she's forced with a bit of a crisis of conscience. You see, one of her enemies is trying to break into this nation, and they're trying to use these portals or gates. Now, she just so happens to have the ability to manipulate those gates, but here's the catch. She can't do it alone, because if she tries to, she will be killed. While it is possible for her to manipulate it, if she does, there's a high chance that it will kill her. So she has an, so so here's what she has been presented with. Another foe that she had to deal with was trying to manipulate the gates themselves, but they would need to have sacrificed these let's let's just call them dolls, because that's what because that's what the that's what the antagonist is calling them. She calls them dolls. But technically speaking, these dolls are just as human as everyone else. The problem is that they have been artificially suppressed. So they're not able to express the emotions, but they are there. They can feel and they can suffer. So once the antagonist goes down, my character is now forced to contend with the fact that she cannot do this alone, and if she wants to manipulate the gates, she has to commit the same atrocity that her antagonist was just about to do. This forces her into a massive, into a massive crisis of fate. Up till now, she's managed to avoid killing anyone that she didn't have to. She's managed to avoid killing innocent bystanders. But now she kind of has to do it, because if she doesn't do it, more people are going to die, and this completely destroys her. Up till now, she has had, she's been able to carry herself just fine. She's had to live with the fact that she's had to run away from a group of people who've been trying to put her head on a spike for the longest time, and she's managed to not engage in the same degree of dehumanizing bull, um, bull crap that these guys have to do. But now she's at the point where if she doesn't do this, more people are going to die. So this isn't even a matter of, of hypocrisy for her by herself or not even standing by her, her, by her ideals. This is just the fact that this girl does not like hurting people. And she literally has to kill these people by using their literal souls as conduits to open up a gate and manipulate it. This completely destroys her. It's, and it's not even a matter of, oh no, she's breaking down and crying. No. She literally, she cannot move. She cannot think. She cannot feel. I spend more time discussing what she's doing in the moment. I describe that she's shaking, she's shivering, her she can she can barely form a sentence. She's just looking at them contemplating what she is about to do. They look as though they're not thinking or feeling anything. Hear what's going on in their heads. She she you call her a telepath or or an empath, whichever, but she can feel all of that. You can really get around write, writing an emotional moment without explicitly writing down that they're crying or they're breaking down. No, you can flat out mention that one, they feel disgusted. T two, I'm going against my philosophies. Three, I am no better than the person I just took down. And four, what was the point of everything I just did? What was the point? If there you go, you can pretty much get an emotional scene by you having your character breaking down things they once held 
and being forced to contradict it because not only is it because the story is like, well, the story has to progress. No, it's like, no, these are the circumstances that's your these are the circumstances that you're dealt with. You either play along with it or what was the point? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it mm. no, you can yeah. go ahead, Nate. Because awesome, I, yeah. I was thinking. No, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. Basically, because um yeah, because you don't like yeah, most of the time like you don't want to go all bombastic and stuff because that's just like 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 especially if the characters also yeah you gotta consider like the characters um temperament originally like basically what you've it's basically what you've basically been saying guys like you got to consider the characters temperament their own like moral standings and how like what is their typical i guess what is their i don't know what is their typical temperament like what what is their what is their default i think that's where you can get most motion from because like a really hyperactive bombastic character like okay if you get really like low depressed like not depressed but like low energy character and you know they're there and every once in a while they're side and blah, blah blah you don't really it's not it and i don't know i guess the context and stuff but most times if they're acting a bit you know sign or something it's not too big a deal it's like not like to too much to be like oh no like what's going on here but like you get really someone who's like usually energetic bombastic positive and then you know and at some point x y and z happen and now they're sign and they've not done that to that point it's just like huh okay that that should be paying attention to there's you know there is some real emotion going on here so yeah i agree most times being subtle about it is 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 better actually also getting like you're saying getting more like the more specific you can get with that that um emotion like with the with the you know the tragedy or the emotion the more specific you can get with conveying it without straight up saying it i think it's better as well like uh for example i would say like too much names of the characters but like there is a, there's some scene there's a scene where uh like a character that a few other characters kind of new dies and like oh, it's been a while since i wrote the scene because i know i haven't rewritten it yet but basically she like she goes through this whole journey with them and she had she had her own character thing and had her own crisis and this other character kind of saw her kind of during her like lower point and and around the time when she kind of picked herself up and he kind of they he kind of helped her like in that you know journey to kind of like help move on from our own like <laughs> um hold on nate can i interrupt you real quick oh, okay yeah. i don't know maybe i don't know if it's just me but you're starting to cut out really frequently yeah i can hear I, he's cutting out for me too i just stayed silent oh, <laughs> mm. i was hoping that it would pass by but it wasn't passing by <laughs> oh no yeah. could it be my signal um what about is it still sounding odd now no, no. sound clear sounds fine now yeah yeah uh, yeah sometimes it gets really weird at, at this time but um what was i saying yeah so like so throughout this whole time this uh this, this character's kind of helped just to kind of like like once she kind of made like the decision to kind of like because she had her own crisis and when she kind of made decisions to kind of push on from that he was kind of there supporting her and and like throughout this whole you know they're going through this whole ordeal and you know they're facing like the the there's this I don't know, this whole arc that happens and like near the end of it they're kind of like you know like she did she did something that like basically did this certain she has the powers and there's one where that they'll, they'll put it like in a real real pinch and uh she used like a power that it, although it kind of helped help her deal with the issue it also shortens her lifespan in it and like to her it's just kind of like well because half the reason why she was like had this crisis is because the things that she wanted to do she knew was like like it almost got a, it almost got her killed before and then do it like she kind of in that situation again and it's kind of like well look again i'm you know at a point where i you know, almost lost my life and everything and there's this part where she's in the elevator they're like basically kind of they're basically basically almost reached the goal they're trying to reach and she's kind of like in there with the others and she's just kind of silent to herself and it's like real crisis of like yeah i'm doing this thing but like at what cost and blah blah, blah. and the other characters like one like notices and he's like 
you know, after all this, how about we do a thing? Like, do you, like, basically trying to talk about the future in it, kind of like, you know, they feel more optimistic. And that helps. But then, basically, she dies. <laughs> and, and, like, it kind of affects a lot of people who were there because they kind of, she was kind of a big catalyst to them make, taking action towards the whole arc reaching, you know, the point it did. And for the character who was kind of one of, like, the main ones that kind of helped, helped her, like, push to you know actually take action in the first place like in the end because they said like he, you know he said oh at the end you know why don't we you know go and have like a dessert or something after this or something and so in the end he kind of like you could say has he just simply in the in the room and i think i've showed it from another character's point of view and you see him just sitting in the kind of corner there with the dessert and it's so that's always from their point of view he's just upset because of the thing and he's having a dessert but because the re the you know, the readers have seen like the context of what they said before. It'll be like, oh damn, like he's just he's kind of just having that dessert by himself, maybe in like, like in memory of that, you know, or you know of what they promised in it. So although nothing's really said directly about it, it's kind of like I think it can add to like the uh, the emotion without necessarily being dramatic. It's just him in in a in a place eating or just sitting there looking at the dessert or whatever so yeah it's a uh, yeah I think definitely being subtle and being more specific about how to convey that emotion I think the better you can really get it personal mm -hmm. is I think the best way to go I agree to that one mm -hmm. well it looks like um looks like Will had to hop out he has a meeting to head off to so oh, okay, I, yeah. yeah I think that would be a good place to end it yeah, for, at this yeah, point okay. yeah I, I just yeah. uh Oh, uh, sorry. Can we? Oh, like, sorry. My bad. Small, no, I'm sorry. That that's small my call. extension. I'm sorry. Go on. Nah. Yeah, go for it. No, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just say my piece of then if you want, we can end it. But uh, mainly, every, everything that has been said is good. But mm. uh, I've noticed that you guys have been focusing on, of course, like you said, um, what was a kite said that uh, you know sadness isn't the only emotion. But mm. uh, I'd say. Equal, you know, there's like, of course, there's um, there's even happiness, or sometimes even being hyped, that can be counted exactly. as an emotion as well. Exactly. And uh, I think, like, from recent memory, uh, one of the most, I think, uh, like a, a, a manga in particular, like two mangas in particular, that have made me feel a lot of like, like I've been very, uh, I felt a lot of like emotional hype, but also a lot of like. Um, I don't know, just intensity oh. and interest in it was like uh, this manga called Umineko no Nakakoroni, which is uh, oh, absolutely. If you know when the seagulls cry or something, it's like a, it's a, it ta what is it? It's by the same guy who made Higurashi. Higurashi. If you, yeah, exactly. So I've been reading the manga, and the manga has such a good way of like invoking uh, like this sense of of hype, of epicness, even though mm. the, it's just a simple story of like a normal dude debating with a witch on whether or not she's real, somehow the way the story is told makes it seem like there, it's a very epic battle of, of wits and like, and like, you know, trying to outsmart one another. Mm. And uh, I don't know, it's just, I've never seen a manga try to like invoke such like, how do you say, such like this emotion of epicness <laughs> you mm. could say mm. uh, even though it's just a simple kind of uh story of uh you know two people talking to each other um or or two people debating against mm. each other um another example is actually also black black clover uh well well i know like i know i know lester has a, his opinions on it i don't know what you guys think of it uh majority majority of people probably uh, don't I don't know. Majority of people either don't care or think it's mid or something like that. Yeah, sadly, but for me, I, sadly, I didn't get it to give it a long enough chance because of the anime to even yeah. really get into it. But I heard it's really good. So I mean, respect to that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not thinking, but I just yeah. Yeah, it's like what was it? I remember I read the manga a bit, like maybe the first three chapters or four chapters before the anime came out. The anime yeah. then came out, and then like you know how everyone crapped on it, and even yeah. even the anime for me it like ruined my. Uh, my thoughts on on the series but a couple of like years later i decided to just give the manga a try and when i did i realized like like 
it's a very simple story. Yeah, it's not very um, amazing, but it's really good at 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 making uh, the reader invested and like get behind these characters. Like he, the I think the author is really good at making these characters likable and then making the reader cheer for these characters. Like for in my opinion, like Asta is uh, was a character I sympathized with a lot because not because I can I relate to him, but just his scenario was uh, very tragic if you think about it. Because um, in the beginning of the story, he has no magic, and uh, and uh, yeah, actually he still doesn't have any magic. But basically, the whole concept is that he was born without any magic in a world where almost everyone has magic, right? Mm. And um, it's like people would say, like, oh, this is like a similar scenario to Deku in My Hero Academia. But the thing with Deku is that he, it's like, what was it? He can still contribute to society, even though he's he has no uh, quirk. Uh, in Asta's case, no matter how muscular he is or how athletic or anything, he cannot contribute to society at all, even as a farmer, because... Farmers basically use magic to like do their to do their work, and using magic is much more efficient than just using your own uh, like physical uh, lifting and stuff. So, I always like thought like his his scenario is probably like the worst scenario you could ever be in. <laughs> so it always I always like like got behind him whenever he would try to uh, kind of uh, you know go against. Uh, what would otherwise have been his fate like try to go against uh, you know society and uh, try to prove himself of his worth and everything like that mm. uh, nah, so yeah, yeah no nah, that's yeah. Uh, you're right i, I actually cuz obviously i didn't watch i didn't I only got through like the first episode but yeah even in the first episode actually it's quite apparent like even a regular farmer would have more worth than him simply because everyone has magic unlike in my yeah. reclaim where you know you could you know you you know, you can get by being an accountant or something. Whereas, I guess in this world, even being an accountant requires some sort of magic to make it more efficient. So it's just like, yeah. Oh damn, yeah. That's good. That's good for it actually. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, for me, I really think, uh, or I really, I think like, um, I think that uh, Black Clover is like a really good manga. Mm. Uh, that's kind of you know under it. It's like of course it's it's not for it's if every if someone is looking for something a little bit more meaningful they won't find it in Black Clover. But Black Clover still has a lot to say even though it's a very simple uh, battle manga. Uh, it has a lot to say uh, still. Like it's very character focused. If uh, that's where like the author is really good at uh, you know at mm -hmm. trying to deliver any sort of emotion or or a message. Um, okay, yeah. yeah but do you mind if I, or, oh, sorry, what were you gonna say? Um, I was gonna check the um, what, what was you gonna say? Because we're probably, I'll see what time it is right now. Cause I haven't actually looked at the times this whole thing. This would be really good though. But uh, so how long are we doing it for? About what time? Is uh, I'd say hour? I'd say like an hour, almost two hours, an hour of forty yeah. minutes. Maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been least Give or take. Yeah, almost two hours. Yeah, now. Okay, cool. Um. We well, we can, we can end it here, actually. Yeah, we'll end it here. We'll end it here, because it was only two hours. Whoa.